Owning any type of restoration business is demanding. Demanding of your time, your energy, and resources. And that's why we're here. This is Restoration Domination. If you're a contractor in water mitigation, mold remediation, biohazard cleanup, roofers, or public adjusters, you'll learn how to dominate using some of the techniques and strategies that our guests will share. We'll interview top industry insiders, movers and shakers, hustlers and hackers, and anyone dominating their industry. This is Restoration Domination. Hustle, hack, and dominate. And here's your host, Rico Garcia. All right, all right, all right. Phil, what's going on, man? Welcome to the show. How are you? Hey, Rico. Man, I'm blessed. Life is good. How are you? Good. Absolutely, man. Any day above ground is a good day. You ready to help us dominate today? Absolutely. Let's go for it, man. Awesome, man. Cool. So do me a favor. Fill in some of the gaps on the intro. Let our listeners and our viewers know exactly who you are, who you with, and more importantly, like how you're helping restoration industries out there. Sure. Um, so I started out in restoration back in 1988, a long time ago. Uh, my father bought a restoration company. I had just graduated high school and actually spring break that uh, my senior year, I started out in the water crew. And then, then through college, I, I filled nearly every position in a restoration company. So we had, uh, we had four offices. Uh, I think probably one of the most uh, significant uh, roles I had, we had a branch office. I went and I was the chief cook and bottle washer and uh, really filled every role. I was answering phone and uh, writing estimates and I was on demo and did everything. Grew an office from 300,000 to about a million and a half in a town of 25,000 people. Uh, so I, wow. I, I've really, I've, I've done a lot of in the restoration world. Our company was bought in 1997. Uh, it was actually bought by a gentleman named Jeff Johnson, another one named Mark Davis. Those, uh, those guys went on to, uh, at this point, uh, own Puro Clean, Puro First Signal uh, Restoration, and the other one, Global Restoration, uh, previously known as Interstate. So I got to got to live in their world for just a little bit. I spent six months with them before I started consulting. I, I moved to uh, Colorado, helped them open an office in Fort Collins. And then at that point, I was ready to move back home. And uh, my father was calling me uh, several nights a week, just asking me advice on his clients, people he was working with, he'd started business mentors. Uh, you know, he had this uh, he had this belief right after he sold the company that restorers needed someone to talk to who'd been in their shoes. And so he hopped in his car. He drove from Eugene, Oregon to Detroit, Michigan, stopping by restorers along the way. And uh, when he came back, he had started business mentors because it was a it was a true belief that this is a complicated industry and someone who kind of understands their role was a valuable resource to him. So. He'd be calling me in the evenings, and uh, I was ready to move back home. So he made me an offer I, in 1997, the fall of 97. He said, come on, work with me. Be my partner. So, um, you know, I wound things down there. And uh, spring of 98, I hopped on board with him as a consultant, 27-year-old business consultant. And so what we do is we help restorers create this vision and a plan where they wanted to go in their business. And then we would come back, grab that plan off the shelf, open it up, and walk people through the transition process to execute and implement change in their business. So, um, right. gosh, that was, uh, what, 24 years ago? And since that time, we've worked with some of the most substan substantial and significant companies in the industry, helped them create that plan. Uh, it's really cool because, uh, you know, one of the neat things we get to do is watch the change process and become, become change agents. And so not only do we bring our skills to the game, every single company we work with, we learn something new. And so we bring that to the next client. And so we work with hundreds of companies over the years. And really, it's been, it's been an exciting process. And so um, at this point, my father's retired. And uh, we've got a team of four other consultants. And it's still the same process, helping companies um, define the vision and plan and create expectations for what their business is going to look like. And then one of the things we do is we look at what's keeping them from getting there. What's helping, what's keeping them, right. pre preventing them from achieving those. And so if we define a plan and then help them walk through the process, because you know what, before we ever came in, they were busy. And so we have to make sure that uh, they're accountable to the things they agreed to do. And so um, it's a, it's a winning formula and uh, it's a fun process. So my, my, that's, that's a really long story of my intro, but you know, how else do you say I've been in, I've been in the restoration industry for 33 years or 34 years. So. I've done a lot. Exactly. 
Exactly. So let me ask you, what is, what is typically you, the restoration company, what do they typically look like when they come to you or an organization like yours and they say, hey, you know what, I think I might need some outside perspective. Are they, tip, are they sub 1 million? Are they 1 to 3, 3 to 10? Like typically, what does that look like? Typically, we, we would work with companies that are larger than, than uh, 2 million. Um, you know, I think there, there's this point, I call it no man's land. There's this point between a million and 3 million where you're too big to be small and too small to be big. And so, you know, I, I, those smaller companies, it's really hard to, first of all, afford what we would bring to the table. And so not only just our costs, but the costs of the recommendations of things people have to do, whether it's hiring people or building software or infrastructure. So a little larger companies, you know, it, quite frequently these days, we're, we're rolling into to larger businesses. So uh, when I just finished up here, uh, we, we finished a couple of year contract with them, but they started out, they were 18 million when we started. And that's the, so, so what happens is people, it's not a size thing. The, the size thing is only a function of what kind of resources do they have in their business and what is it that we can bring to the table and help pay for ourselves and also where they have the resources to invest in their business. And so, you know, a minimum size would be a couple million and a maximum size, you know, we worked with one of the large national players a couple of years ago, helping them define their compensation system for their project managers. And so, you know, our largest company was uh, nearly a half a billion dollars. It, it kind of all flavors and all sorts. And, and really where people bring us in and where they find they have this challenge is that they're discontent with something in their business. They know they should be doing something different. They need something more. Something's not happening. So my friend Mark Springer, one day, we were at the end of a, uh, he's with Day Spring Restoration in Montana. We're at the end of a strategic planning meeting. And um, we were up at a, uh, up in the mountains up in Montana. And he just smiles and he starts laughing. I said, what's that, Mark? And he says, you know the part about banging your head against the wall for so long? And I said, yeah, no, what's that, Mark? He says, well, it feels so good when you stop. And so, yeah, yeah. so really what's going on is people get to a point in their business and they, they realize that something's missing. They need to be doing something different. Something should change. And it's hard to find time to really look at your business and make that change. And so people realize that, you know, whether, whether it's myself or one of my uh, peers in the industry, somebody from outside their business can be a great resource to help them see the things they can't see, see the forest through the trees. So I think that, you know, what, what happens is it, it's not necessarily a size, it's a discontentment or it's this desire to do something or be something that they're not yet. Right. So how do you, what would you recommend for, you know, the one to $3 million company that maybe hasn't gotten to the point where they feel that they need consultant, but you know that the bottleneck is coming at some point. Cause it, I mean, again, what got you to one to three, isn't going to get you to 10, right. And what got you to 10 probably isn't going to get you to 20. Uh, and we all know that, right. But for some reason, most business owners, most entrepreneurs, they're like, Hey, I got this far on my own. Right. So what would you say are the red flags that business owners need to start looking at to say, hey, you know what, this could be avoidable. This could potentially be a bottleneck. What would you say that is? Is it typically the hiring process? Is it infrastructure? Is it SOPs? Yeah, a couple of things. So the first thing is it reminds me of a book, my father's favorite book, uh, Marshall Goldsmith. I think it's Goldsmith. What got you here won't get you there. And have you ever read that yep. one? He, he liked it a lot more than I did, but I just thought, you know, the, the story of people just figure that uh, a $10 million company is simply 10, $1 million companies stacked on top of each other. And so I think that we're, we're, the, we're the, the key things. Let's say that one of the most common elements when we come into a business is making sure people have good data. You know, if they've got good financial information, they have good systems and process, they've got, they've got a good understanding of their KPIs and their metrics, it makes everything faster. But you know what, most of these people say, you know, if you're a million dollar company, you, you're an entrepreneur, a true entrepreneur, you're probably really good at something. So you just figure, you know what, I'm just going to go do more of that. And the next thing you know, you're running a business and you're not that entrepreneur that's a, dry, a, a good carpenter or a good carpet cleaner. You're now a restoration company. And so one of the things that I always advise, the, the very first thing that we do is come in and say, okay, give me your numbers. Let's take, you know, I, I have a, one of my colleagues, he, uh, he likes to say somewhere, somewhere in the numbers lies the truth. And so if you can't, you know, th there's people who just say they're busy. I'm busy. But what does that mean? Are you, are you busy doing things? Are you busy achieving things? If I start looking at the financials and the numbers and the metrics, if you're telling me you're an estimator and you're busy and you're writing five hundred thousand dollars worth of estimates, you're you're busy, but you're not you're not effective. 
And so start getting your metrics in place. And whether you're using Dash or PSA or Restoration Manager or whatever it is, start not only putting information in it, but running reports out just to get some metrics and see what's happening in your business. You know, the, the first time you run those reports, and if you've ever experienced that in growing companies, when you run reports, they're just a mess. And so you stop looking at them. But really, if you start, if you want to know, you want accountability in your business, you want to know how effective somebody is, figure out how much they invoice. Figure out how much they estimate. Quantify what they do. Figure their gross margins. Figure the, you know, the, their, their revenue numbers, whatever it is. But start running the reports. And when you run the reports, you're going to figure out where your failures are that are creating the garbage that's in the output. So really start looking at your numbers. Look at your information. Be serious about it. People don't look at job costing. They don't look at their financials. They don't, you know, they just do. And that'll catch up to you. I think that, um, you know, really having good assessments allows you, I'll give you a story. So if you find yourself in your business sitting there and saying, you know, it seems to me we're doing well. I think he's doing a good job. Kind of. I kind of feel good. I kind of think we're profitable. I can, if you say those things, it's clear to me you have no objective measures that's in your company. And it's going to catch up to you real fast because things get serious. I, talk, I talked to a guy yesterday. He's got, uh, he had four fires he signed this week, four fires, and he's trying to be a cash business. He, he just bought the business and he, his, his accounts, receive, his line of credit's getting put in place, but it's not there right now. And so because he understands the business of it, because he's been, it's a family business, he bought it from his father. He knows from his metrics that he's got all these signed contracts. He's got costs on a pack out. $20,000 in costs on a pack out. He's got no money. He's got no money to cover that. And so we talked about, talked to him about collect your money, know where it's coming because he, he at least has, he at least has the information to know how much he should have billed. He knows where his costs are, but he also knows where those risk factors are from a financial and a, a quantifiable standpoint. And so that would be one of those stories like, gosh, I feel like we're really busy. And that's a company that could go drive right into the ditch because they don't understand where and how the, the key challenges or problems are going to come at them because of that. You know, just getting work isn't good. Getting work, being profitable, right. collecting the money at the end of it is is what's going to create that successful company on the other side. I don't know if I answered your question. I got to think of what your question was. <laughs> yeah. Well, do you think that the financial metrics is the one thing that is consistently the bottleneck or that's the biggest co common denominator with all restoration companies? In other words, they're really not taking the time from the very onset to say, hey, look, I'm going to track how many phone calls, how many of those phone calls turn into estimates, how many estimates turn into invoices, and all the way down the line. Is that where you find when you're looking at companies that are trying to grow, that that's where they have some of the inefficiencies? Yeah, so th there's a lot in that. So when you said the financial numbers, I mean, it's, not just, it's not just financial numbers. And you talk about job count and quantity and invoicing and, and all of that. So that's the bigger picture. And so that, what it is, is that's a roadblock that creates a lot of risk in your company if you don't know that. And so, yeah, spend some time really cleaning up your numbers and become really familiar with what's going on and make sense of that. And if you make sense of that, then it starts taking away some risk because it can, can become predictable and it can start answering a whole lot. It can start predicting a whole lot of the problems you can have before you have the problems. And so, right. yeah, is it one of the biggest, it is one of the biggest problems. It doesn't mean that everybody has that problem. The nice thing is if somebody's got good metrics and good numbers, we can move through that really quickly on the other side. But, you know, a lot of times people just don't, they don't make sense of what they have either. And so, you know, let's give an example. If you don't have job costing, then how can you effectively manage profitability on your jobs? And so that's, that's one of the things as a takeaway here. If you don't know where your profit margins are or where they should be in the industry, then how do you ever, ever impact that number or the nexus in there? And so if you looked at that and said, okay, my gross profit margin on construction, I should be achieving 40% and I'm making 20%. And I've seen that before. You're leaving 20 points on the table. Where's that money going? It's just sifting right through your fingers. It's going to your subcontractors and driving up these great, big, beautiful trucks, or it's going to pure inefficiencies. Maybe people are siphoning it out of your business. You don't really know. And so having those good metrics and numbers will really uh, allow you to do a whole lot of uh, kind of leveraging your resources and your opportunities in your business. Awesome. So let's just assume for a second that, you know, organizations, they're tracking their numbers, have been tracking their numbers really, really well. Uh, they're familiar with the data, with what majority of people would say are the most important KPIs, but they still have a problem with scaling their business, yeah. right? They're trying to, you know, again, because you can know your numbers seven ways from Sunday. Sure. 
that's one part of the puzzle. But then how do you generate even more revenue and still maintain a profit margin, right? Because again, a lot of people also talk about revenue and they talk about revenue as if it's the end all be all. What that just shows is your ability to sign a contract. It doesn't show the ability to be profitable in business, yep. right? So what's that typically look like for most, most organizations that are looking to take it to the next level? What, where do you find it easiest to scale business? Is it bolting on additional products or services, or is it being much more aggressive on the marketing side? What's your suggestion? Uh, so two things. So the, the first one is, so I've got a company I'm just starting to work with in the Southeast, and they're about a $10 million company. And the thing that, so I started looking at, okay, we need our financial information, we need our data there as we get the data. And so I believe they, I'm confident in what they have in the data. Now, the next thing is I want to make sure they can fulfill production because it, it, in my mind, it's easy to get work. We're getting work is, is it's a process. It just takes time. It makes a certain number of phone calls or a certain activity and you're disciplined about it. It's about relationships in this industry. And so, you know, even, even getting on a TPA program, it's, it's a process, but you know, the question is, is it going to take one year or five years, but you go through the process and at the end, you're going to get the work that you need. But if you can't fulfill it, getting work is easy the first time. Getting work the second time is much, much more difficult. And so I was looking to say, okay, how do we match up our production capacity and capabilities with our sales abilities? So you got your administrative functions. Now you've got your production functions and say, okay, I can do the work that I got and I can be effective and efficient at it. And then I can also measure it as I'm going through. And then I, now I can go get it. And so if you've got those elements together, now let's, say it's parting, let's craft a really solid plan for domination. And so if it's domination, so the first thing that I look at in sales in a, in, a, in a restoration company, if you're doing this and saying, you know, marketing is the responsibility of that doorway down the hall. It's the marketing team and the marketing team is going to grow our business. Those companies, they may be successful, but it, it's, a, it's a real slow process. I think that when you create a sales-based culture, this is what I learned from Mark Davis. Uh, Mark Davis said, we are a sales organization that just happens to, we're a, a sales and marketing company that just happens to operate a restoration business. And so it starts with culture. That's beautiful. So if your culture is, we're going to sell, so a sales-based company says, we sold the job yesterday. That was yesterday. What are we doing today? What are we going to go sell? And so if it's, everybody plays a role in, in, in their business, in sales and is accountable to those numbers. Now, all of a sudden, you have some real synergies that you can create there. Um, I, I saw you had Rachel Stewart on here um, some some episodes ago. Yes. And one of the things we did with Titan Restoration, work with them years ago, is everybody, every manager in the company on an annual basis would set sales goals, including the people in the office, saying, I know somebody, I can, and then it was measured on a monthly basis. How you doing? on progress towards your goals. And so if, if you've got the opportunity, and, and here's a simple, just a, a, every opportunity you talk with a potential client is an opportunity to talk to them about your business and selling your next job. And so if, um, if you're calling up an adjuster and you're gonna tell them about, you're gonna ask them about collection, hey, you know, we're gonna finish up Mrs. Jones's job tomorrow or next week, let's go next week. We're gonna finish it up next week. I just wanted to see, is that gonna be a two or three party payable check? I should probably know that answer by then, but um, is that gonna be sent to me? Is it gonna to go to the customer? Great, hey, uh, by the way, I just wanted to let you know that she is gonna be delighted. And I wanna know if there's anything sitting on your desk and help, I can help you with. If there's something sitting on the desk, I'm gonna send it to you. It was a different world probably a dozen years ago. I talked with a guy and, and he says, oh, is that easy? I said, yeah, it's that easy. And so he goes out and he starts out with some of the adjusters that he had. He had sold 600,000 the next month, 600,000 on work the next month because he asked the question. People had claims right. sitting on their desk. The problem was he had a fulfillment pro problem on the other end because I don't think any of us ever anticipated that he could sell at that level. So. What I would look at is say, okay, yeah, we need to have an effective marketing plan, our branding, our business development, and that's prospecting. But we have relationship stuff. Everybody's got relationships. And how can you influence those relationships to turn it back to your business? And so it's asking the adjuster when you're talking to them for a business function, a business purpose, like a collection or a delighted customer or clarification or whatever, and then asking for the next job. Um, I went with a guy to his banker. And we're just working on his line of credit because one of the things we'll talk about in scaling, scaling a business is having the capital structure to fund the business that you're going to build and grow. I'll, I'll come back to that point in a minute, but um, we're talking about capital and people believe they can grow their business to their greatest strength. But in reality, their, their, their problem in growth is going to be the greatest, their greatest weaknesses. 
And one of their weaknesses is capital. Do you have the ability to finance the work coming at you? So no, as I'm sitting back with this client, we go in to talk with this banker about his line of credit. And by the way, just uh, I'm bounced around a lot of stuff, but on line of credit, I always like about 30 days of sales in a line of credit. And I want to attach it to my accounts receivable because as my accounts receivable grows, then I get my accounts receivable that, uh, or my, my line grows to meet the, the needs that I have in my organization. And so we're sitting down with the banker and we're just talking about, here's our plans, here's where we're going. And you're going to be a vital part of this plan. And we just wanted to let you know what our business is and, and our ideas and thoughts. And uh, at the, so as we go through and finish our pitch, I, I asked her, we take a real active role in our, in our business advising. We, we don't do the work, but we, we mentor people. So I'm sitting down with the banker and I asked the banker, hey, um, do you have any uh, property management clients or you guys, you guys are the biggest bank in this town? You've got to have, you've got to have real estate holdings, whether it's your banks or or houses your uh, or properties you're financing or your management company. Is there any way that we can get work from you? And then she started talking about all these jobs that they ran into and had. So here I am talking about banking and I'm asking for work. And we walked out and the the owner of the company looks at me and the we're walking across the parking lot to his car and he just smiles and he says, "So it's that easy, huh?" I said, "Yeah, it is. It's that easy. It's a conversation." And so if you're always, right. you know, if you're always selling, you should never be slow. I think what happens, I always figure that, that sales and restoration, it's kind of, I call it boa constrictor sales. I've got a boa constrictor, which is, I'm assuming starving. And it goes out and it finds a rat and it swallows that rat. And while, it, while it's digesting the rat, it does nothing else. Well, we do right. that a lot in restoration. We go out and sell a really big job. And then we spend the next 30 days digesting the job. And then we're done with that job. And now we're going to look for our next one. And so when you do that, your sales start doing this. They go up and down and up and down. Well, if you want this in your sales, which I think would be an effective goal or strategy is to get more, let's say, predictability in your sales and your revenue and your cash, always be marketing. Market when you're slow, market when you're busy. Because when you're slow, everybody right. else is marketing. All your competition is out right. there. They're all having the same com com conversations. So if you're if you're asking for the next job, then you should never be slow. And and you know I, I, there are companies that when you start getting your metrics and your numbers, there's companies that know that the month of May, June, and July, or April, May, June, or whatever whatever those three months are in their business, it's always slow. I said if you know it's slow, then why don't you do something about it six months in advance, not at the time that you're slow. You know it's coming. You know for the last three years it's been slow in May. Then you better start marketing in December. How are you going to overcome that? Maybe it's new sources. I always think, you know, people get distracted. So I, I call it entrepreneurial drift. In restoration, there's so many things we can do. We can paint houses. We can clean carpets. We can, we can do maid service. We can do janitorial. We, we can build new homes. And the problem is we don't take advantage of the things that are sitting right in front of us already. And now we're going to go exactly. do something else. And we get distracted. And it keeps us from doing the things that make us, effect, that make us effective. And again, something that we've mentioned on the show time and time again, it's all about, it really is sometimes as simple as simply asking for the order. Hey, wherever you're at, this is what I do. What do you got? You know, how can I go ahead and service you? And you'd be surprised at least expectant, you know, conversation. All of a sudden they have, you know, they're a property manager or, you know, they've got a portfolio of, you know, real estate that they need servicing. Whatever the case may be, it's again, it's where wherever you are being able to, sell your product and your service and putting it out there. And again, if you don't ask, you'll never get it, right? So that same principle just kind of going back to, this is a conversation that we've had time and time again. And a lot of people, I think in our industry, a lot of this stems from the TPA work. Because again, you, a lot of companies get so much insurance work and they're like, oh, okay, cool. I'm quote unquote sitting pretty. I'm really, really busy. But then they have a cash flow issue, but then they're so caught up in that mess that they don't prospect for new cash clients or other relationships that are right in their backyard. Yeah. So, so what am I, I don't know if any of the TPAs watch this, don't take this personally, but I always call, I always think of the TPA work as kind of like crack cocaine. You know, you, you, when you do it, it feels really good, but the problem is you can't get off of it and you become addicted. And so you stop doing the things that help you become self-sufficient because the work, work just fed to you and it's fed to you and it's fed to you. And then you become beholden to that work and to those clients and you're not in control of your business anymore. The jobs are smaller. They're less, probably less profitable. And one of the things that makes them less profitable is there's a lot of administrative work that goes into it. And so if I'm doing TPA's work, one of the things that the beauty of the TPA to the insurance company 
is the TPA and the contractor now go take on all this administrative? No, I'm sorry. The contractor takes on this administrative work that the adjuster used to have to do, and we pay the, the TPA for the opportunity to do that for them. So I'm not saying don't do it, but I think the reality is you need to have balance in your work and you have to have predictability in your work and you have to be in control of it. So I have a client right now, and one of the things we did is we peeled off his TPA. We call it his core work from his large loss and his, his uh, self-driven work. And we really started looking at it. It's very difficult to be profitable on just TPA work. The margins are supported because you get a lot of mitigation and higher margin stuff. But on just the construction alone, it's tough to, to maintain the margins that you need. And then including the indirect costs. And that's what people don't measure. They don't understand what am I, how many administrative people do I have to have involved in the intake on the updating my numbers or my metrics and making sure that the photos are in there and everything else. They have to take a look at those costs. So... I'm not anti-TPA. I think it should be, I, I, if I was running a restoration company, it would probably be a part of my business, but I would keep it small, 20%. Right. So on that note, let's just take a quick opportunity yeah. to thank our sponsors. Photo documentation is possibly one of the most important aspects of what it is that we do in the restoration business. Not only so that the client knows exactly what's going on, but also so that you can prove your work to insurance companies. One of the best ways that I found to go ahead and document our projects is by using Company Cam. Company Cam is an amazing app. It has so many features, everything from time stamped and GPS located photos, uh, individual project files, unlimited photo storage, in-app communication with your crew, a live stream of all of your projects as the photos are coming in, as if it was an Instagram feed. So from a managerial standpoint, company cam can help you there as well. But more importantly, it gives you the ability to protect your organization while documenting and keeping everything nice and neat. So we've got a really special offer for you. If you go to companycam.com forward slash dominate, not only will you get your 14 day free trial, but you're also going to get the first two months, 50% off. So again, head on over to companycam.com forward slash dominate get the app and I'm sure you're going to love it. All right, guys. So we are back. So now we just want to go ahead and switch gears real quick. Let's talk about, uh, dive a little bit deeper into the whole marketing aspect of things. Like again, the restoration industry as a general rule, unless you're one of the huge, huge franchises really doesn't do a lot on the front of marketing, right? They do okay. But when you compare the restoration industry to a lot of other industries, I feel, always feel like we're lagging behind on the marketing side. So what like what tips or tricks would you suggest for restoration companies that are looking to scale their business, maybe that are looking to go direct to consumer that could really go ahead and move the needle from a marketing standpoint? Are there any particular channels that you like more than others? Well, so it depends. My, <laughs> it just reminds me of a marketing professor I had in college. And you'd answer the question, depends. And he'd say, aha, his name is Aviv Shoham. He says, aha, depends on what? It depends on what it is you want to achieve or do or be in your company. And so if you just say, I'm going to go market or what are, what's everybody else doing? I'm going to go do what they're doing. So I think the first thing I would do is that you got to start with who your company is going to be and what your identity is. And so I'd start with my, with my company goals. I'm going to start with a big picture. Here's what I want to do. I want commercial work. I want to get more adjuster direct, more insurance agent work, more, more water damage, more. So if you define what kind of work you want, now you can look and say, okay, what are the potential? So you got your verticals, you define my verticals. Now I'm going to figure out where I can go get that. So if I'm a larger company and I've got a lot of resources, I might look and say, I'm going to go do um, a lot of uh, education, lunch and learns for property management companies. And that can be a very effective resource, but realize that if you're doing that, you're probably out there competing with the really big players in your market. And so maybe it's maybe it's healthcare. If you can do healthcare, you know th that's a great that's a great vertical. Th there was a guy that, that I spoke to a long time ago, and he was uh, had a three hundred million dollar company doing about one hundred fifty million dollars worth of work in hospitals. And he said, you know how it works. He says the first hospital I went into, so I got a, I went in for a, a mold job or a water damage. He says it's two years later. I've never left the hospital. Just wow. it went one job to the next. So it's just verticals. Maybe it's TPA work. And if I want more TPA, well, I think your question was if I'm going to do self-directed work. I'm going to look at what my goals are. Then I'm going to take a look at my marketplace. I'm going to take a look at, at strategically what my competitors are doing, and then I'm going to figure out where they're not and where I can fit in that. You know, one of the things people say, "Oh, I'm going to join the Adjuster Association." 
You ever go to those? You got two retired adjusters, you got 17 vendors, and you got some outside speaker coming and talking. And that's that's right. most of the adjuster meetings I've ever been to. Doesn't mean that's all of them. So it, it's going to be different in different markets. I'm going to look at it. And it's also different based on what my competencies are or what kind of work I'm going to get. And so if I'm going to define that I want to have 40% of my work being mitigation, I want to get 50% from uh, non-TPA programs, and then I want to get, you know, have no more than 20% from a single client. So now I've got those kind of rocks that I've got in place, and I'm going to try to fill in the pieces around it that help me achieve that. And so, you know, there's my friend Jerry Edel. I don't know if uh, you've ever spoke with him, but he helps people get work from insurance agents. I know Wylander Group is doing that, and there's some other people that will help you tap into some, what some people thought was a forgotten opportunity. Insurance adjusters, what does your internet presence look like? There's a larger company that I've uh, spoke with before, and they, they're doing $30 million worth of work. That's the total revenue in a, in a marketplace. That's probably about what they can get. 35% of the work comes from the internet, but they sit down with their internet, their, their internet, kind of the, the marketing agency that they work with. They sit down with them on a weekly basis and they look at keywords. They look at strategy, look at what's working, where the calls are coming from. They listen to the phone calls. You've got jobs that came in uh, from a mitigation standpoint and we never try to sell the reconstruction. Why is that? Right. That should be amazing. That should be a 90% close rate. We just should have delighted them on the mitigation side now, why don't we just go do the repairs for them? Because we've got a, a good entree to that. I've got a number of companies that go on to fire sites that do large construction jobs, and they're getting referrals from the fire departments. You can do that through, a, through the 800 board up program, but you can do it on your own. You can build relationships. You can go talk to the fire departments and say, hey, you just want to let you know we're here and, we, and give them your your information and tell them why you should be the best person to respond to those needs. And then if you got the opportunity, you show up on job sites and they recognize and know you and they would, uh, you know, a lot of times they'll accept you being there as opposed to trying to chase you off. And so right. um, there, so companies I've worked with are getting massive amounts of work, but not by chasing the fires, but by being a, a an advocate of somebody that is there to help. And when you're there to help, now all of a sudden you can get more opportunities. And so, you know, th th there's a lot of people going after plumbers. That's an interesting game. The problem with, with the plumber work is it's a pay for play. If I'm going to go get plumber work, some markets, I'm going to pay $1,000 to get those leads. Which in my opinion, personally, and again, I know that, that that particular strategy has worked well. I mean, I know that there's people in our restoration industry that they have courses specifically on how to go out and pitch plumbers and offer them a thousand bucks. Problem is, is that, you know, later on down the road, if, you know, so-and-so's cousin all of a sudden gets into the business, they're no longer, you know, sending you any referrals, right? And at the end of the day, typically the person that you're paying that referral fee to, they're not the actual plumber, right? Yeah. It's it's the their tech that found the job and then... You know, the, the tech that's making the referral really didn't get, a, uh, you know, to wet his beak, if you will. Yes. So that's a that's a very short sighted it strategy. Is. I know that it's worked for plenty. The, the better strategy, I think, is those plumbers. Plumbers want more plumbing jobs. That's period. Roofers want more roofing jobs. Public adjusters want more clients to sign. If you can become an asset to those individuals to where your organization is providing them with more business, and then in turn, now you have a symbiotic relationship, that's a much more cleaner, symbiotic, long-lasting yes. relationship that would typically last. But again, I mean, to kind of sum it up everything that you've just said, I mean, there's no right or wrong way when it comes down to marketing. You just got to figure out, get really, really clear on what kind of an organization you are. Do you want more water mitt jobs? Do you want fire resto jobs? Do you, what, you know, what side of town you want to be on? Get really clear on that and then go ahead and start deploying a strategy to acquire that particular goal. Be consistent on it. Be consistent. Yeah, right. There are too many people that just abandon their efforts because they're just scattered. They're going to do lots of everything and they really don't really spend the time to say, is this working or not? Um, right. yeah, back to the plumbing thing. And I just want to say that there is, there's a franchise out there, one Tom Plumber, teaching restoration companies how to do plumbing. It's, it's amazing. I actually checked a couple of their references and, and it's fascinating. First of all, they're, they're massively profitable on their plumbing end. And then it's the synergy of going into a, uh, it, it was a guy I talked to that he said, you know, I used to go into these uh, retirement homes and I go in and say, yeah, I do restoration. I got 24, 365. I was there. Remember, we can help you in time of need. And then they'd say, great, give me a card. I'm interested, but uh, you know, I got nothing. They go in now and they market and say, I'm a plumber and I do restoration. 
they say, oh, fascinating. I got two jobs I can give you right now. And then, right. um, so it's just interesting. So um, I, I'd take a look at something like that. I think they're good. I think that that's kind of switching the tables. There's the, you know, if you look at Rotor Rooter or the other plumbing companies, there's one, a big one out of San Diego and others that are saying, I'm going to be in restoration. Look how much money they're paying me. It's got to be massively profitable to do this. So, right. you know, I just, so one of the things I do is I, I'd make sure that I'm consistent, not too scattered. I create my plan. I'd make sure that if I've got probably, I'd probably limit it to three or four different verticals and have a, if I'm, if I'm a marketing rep, I'm going to tie it into a couple hundred contacts and I'm going to go see them consistently and keep following up and keep your list fresh. You know, I think that that's, those are the things that I would do. And then I'd make sure that uh, going back to one of the most effective things is everybody playing a role in business development and in building contacts and, and relationships. Everybody, every insurance, every restoration company has an insurance provider. Right. Are they getting work from? Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So now switching gears yeah. real quick, the hot buzz, right? The hot topic is labor, labor, labor. Everybody's talking about how horrible it is to get labor, to get people out there, uh, you know, get them working. Obviously, if you're looking to scale your company, labor is, you need the labor. Like you just need the bodies to go ahead and fulfill the work. Yep. So What's your take on the modern labor market and what is the restoration industry doing wrong when trying to acquire new talent or what are they doing right? Okay. So a couple of things, one of the things is really interesting in, in the last year, I've seen a shift. It used to be really hard to find people with skills in restoration or construction skills. Or So the companies I'm working with are having more success on the management level positions. They're just more available than they were a year ago. It's the frontline employees. They're just not there. And so the first thing that a lot of companies I'm working with are doing is they're having to look at what they pay their employees. So we have to retain who we have and we have to find new people. So those are, those are both sides of it. And too often we just look at how do we find new people and then, we, then we're losing them on the other side. So uh, compensation is a part of it. Communication, making sure they feel a part of what you're doing. Um, I always like to type when, when people come and work in, in, well, Robin Sharma in his book, Leadership Wisdom, the monk who sold his Ferrari, he said that you need to tie paycheck to purpose. So one of the things I'm going to do is make sure that people understand the purpose of what we do. We restore life and, you know, it's going to be different for each company, but mine would be we restore lives and livelihoods of people impacted by a disaster in their business or their home. Well, that's really cool. Now I'm, now I'm in the middle of things that I'm making people's lives better. Now I'm not just extracting water, but I'm just extracting water. You know what? I can go flip burgers too. So right. the, the other thing is, is um, we need to make sure that we have a good orientation program. So when we bring people in, they stay. So what's our onboarding program? How do we make sure they understand and they have the skills to perform and produce and feel like they were given support at the beginning? Because there's, there's a lot of people that come in and after the first 30 days, they're already looking for their next job. So right, you know, right now, what, what unemployment in the state of Oregon, all time low at 4.1%. 4 and I think that we're probably higher than others. People who you need to find for jobs are already working. So the first thing is you have to go find them where they're working. Develop little business cards. There was a, there was a guy in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, yeah, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, back 15 years ago when oil was really huge up there. And, you know, this was unheard of. He says, gosh, people working at McDonald's are making 18 bucks an hour. And so one of his strategies that he had to employ, and I just, I, I, so I've talked to other people, they say done the same thing and it works. He had little business cards that said, we're looking for great people. And whenever he saw people working really well, that they would hand this card and say, you know, we'd, we'd love to add people like you to our team because we're looking for good people and good hard workers. And so find people who are working where they're working and make sure that uh, they know about your company. And then you have to, maybe it's as you get bigger, maybe you have to hire somebody who is, is always out, becomes a job function looking for people. So if you're, a, if you're a 10, $15 million company, maybe it's time to look at bringing on that HR person to make the phone ring. You can't put an ad in, in Craigslist or wherever and expect to get 50 resumes. So, right. so I, I think a couple of things I look at, I, I look at maybe- let me, let me ask you this. Yeah. Do you think that at its core though, that considering all the opportunities that are available today, um, do you just think that it just boils down to simple money, like what the restoration industry is in fact paying to the front lines? No, 
No, I think when, that- when compared to and hear, and hear me out on this, right? Because again, I'm not talking to the 50 year old guy out there. Like that's not who I'm talking to. I'm talking about, you know, the 18 year old kid who's looking to go ahead and get into something to, you know, the 35, maybe even 40 year old with so many online opportunities, right? From drop shipping to e-com to, you know, fulfillment by Amazon, I mean, you name it, the list just goes on. And what restoration tax actually make, right? Well, most companies are paying restoration tax. Do you think that ultimately people are just looking at this and saying, you know what, maybe I don't want to be in a truck all day and, you know, sucking carpets. Uh, Maybe I should learn this new skill and be able to hang out with the family on the weekends and I can pretty much manage my business from the laptop. Do you think that fundamentally that's the bigger issue? Um, It's an element. I don't think it's the biggest issue because if if all it is, is about money, it goes back to almost like the plumbing story. If I'm going to pay somebody $15 $15 an hour. Why not 16? The person making 16 wants 17. You're always chasing after dollars. And so right. there was a, there was a study that came out forever ago. And it, it said that, uh, you know, it, it asked the employees to review and rate what they want at the top, you know, rate these things in your, in, in your position in the company you work for. And they'd rate them on a scale of one to 10. And then they asked the, the employers to do the same thing. What do you think your employees want? The employees didn't rank pay number one. Now, it's a different world today, but they ranked it like number three. They wanted, they wanted to say in what, right. what the company's doing. They, want, they wanted to know where the company's going. They wanted to have, they wanted to be heard. They want, I'm guessing they want to have flexibility in their job. They want to have other things. And the boss, the employer said they want money. That's all they want is money. Well, the way I look at that, the reason they, the employers said they only wanted money because they didn't give them everything else. So what is it your employees want in the company? I think they want upper mobility. I think they want flexibility in their job. They want interesting work. They want to be a part of something that's bigger than them. And so bring employees in. What's the vision of your company? Where are you going? What is this company you're working for? And why do they want to spend and invest their selves and their time into it? So I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that, I, that I'm in, in some of the reading I'm doing, I think the next generation, what is it, uh, generation... I, I couldn't even, the, the young kids, the, the 18, 19, 20 year olds, think a little different than the, the, the generation before them. It was just all about uh, you know, them and their own desires and pleasures and whatever they wanted to do. This next generation, I think, is coming into the table with some skills. And so I look at kind of digging into that market of the, the younger kids, but at the same time, really look at what it is that you offer to the people working for you. Why would anybody want to be a part of your organization? Do you, st- are you, there's some places I just go in that they, they're just always so critical. They're critical of everything as opposed to building people up and telling them they're proud of them, giving them opportunity, giving them a career path. Do you ever talk about a career path to your technicians? There, there's one company I work with that every year, 100% of their technicians, and they have 50 technicians in their company, 100% of those companies or employees get a, and I think it might even be more often than every year. They get a goal setting and review meeting. Like, where is it? What is it that you want in your company and how can I help you get there? Yes, right. it, money is important. And I think you can't, you can't, I, I, I just every time I drive down the road and I see hiring $1,500 bonus, signing bonus, $20 an hour. And this is a fast food restaurants. You can't ignore <laughs> that that's a reality of what's going on. You do need to take a look at what you pay and how you compensate your employees. But money is not the only thing. And if you put the other stuff in place, you do need to put the other things in place, then money it doesn't have to be the only thing. And I think you can create a good workforce. And then you have to make sure the people who are working for you and are happy with you start putting the word out there and telling the people they know and then giving them an incentive to bring people on board that are just like them. Right. Um, so what would you recommend for an organization now that currently has their tax? Maybe they haven't been really close with their technicians and their frontline people. It's always typically really difficult to go ahead and start something new, right? Because if you've never really had a conversation with your, with your people with regards to a career path, like, you know, maybe you make that recommendation to an owner, but now they start feeling a little funny about it. They're like, I don't know. Like, you know what? I've had John on the front lines for the two, for two years. I've never once asked him about, you know, growing my company. What are some tax? practical baby steps that an owner can take or branch manager can take in order to go ahead and start lifting that kind of morale and getting more buy-in from their people. So, so the discussion needs to start at the top, but if the owner is the one who's expected to execute and implement everything, it's not going to get done. It can't get done. So from a top level, you need to have an understanding of what it is that we want to achieve. I mean, you push it down to the people managing at that mid-level. And you need to, to have them, you know what, take the guys out to lunch. Just start having conversations. 
figure out how they're doing. Learn. That. But one of the things you can do, I, this is a different, um, going a different tack. There, there was uh, a guy I worked with and he had a large company, a really large building. And a lot of times just the owners park at the front door and walk right in. They got the best parking spot. This guy, it's a, it was a $30 million company. He would park in the very, very back of his parking lot and he would walk in through the back door and he would greet every one of his employees in the warehouse in the morning. Hey, how you doing? How's your wife? What's going on with your son? How was the soccer game last night? You know, it's so just having a connection with the people working with you is important. Now, the second thing is, is start talking with the managers and have them, first of all, challenge them say, okay, build, I want you to start building upper mobility with these people. I want to start figuring out what their skill sets are and how we can add to those. What kind of training are we doing? Do we have leadership training? Do we have book clubs and opportunities? Can they go online and learn more about restoration? Are there things that we're giving them and resources that they're getting? We have 100% of the companies that we work with when we start, the employees fill out a confidential questionnaire. And one of the questions is, um, you know, how is your company on training? And almost universally, most of them are rated very lowly, low on training. Train your employees. There's resources and opportunities out there. They don't even have to leave their house. They, right. they, you know, Restoration Leadership Institute. They've got uh, or REITS Academy. You've got good online sources. People can get knowledge and information. So they're, first of all, talk to your employees about how they can improve on those things. Make sure that people get an annual review. And you know what? Maybe give them a shorter, quicker quarterly review. It just here's your five things you got to work on or five, here's five categories. If you're doing these five categories well, you're generally filling your job well. So start giving feedback and communication to your employees on how they can become better. And then, then you can start filling the pieces and saying, okay, we got restoration tech one, tech two, tech three. You got the three levels and here's how you go from one to the next. That's a pretty complex process, but it's not foreign. It's not, right. And then there's also you know, just other resources that can help people know how to do their job better. And if they, have, if they feel like they're armed to produce and do better, they're going to be a better contributor. They're going to be happier with what they're doing. And then maybe, maybe they're going to want to stick around longer. They're going to become project managers or they want to they have a different role in the company. And so having that conversation with the employees is good. Having the structure that communicates with the employees is important. I think there's, you know, there's a whole lot that goes into that. And it is complex. But I think the, the first thing is you got to sit down and say, okay, here's what I want to achieve. Big picture then what are some strategies that we can implement to get us from here to there and just start doing one, one at a time. If you say, I, right. I want to create this whole thing and I'm not going to do anything until I do the entire thing. Then my, my response will be, you do nothing. It'll be nothing. You end up doing you get, absolutely you'll nothing. You'll be too busy. So I think I'd go back and say, okay, let's, let's really take these one at a time and let's define our expectations and needs and then, then start identifying the 15 things that need to happen in order to make that uh, to, 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 to be implemented or executed. So write a job description, <laughs> write a job description, put KPIs, <laughs> right. put key things they need to achieve. Um, how contents cleaning? What and really yeah. get company buy-in? Like really, it's it's all it's about progress, right? Feeling because nothing I think kills the human soul like waking up every single day and then you know that you're just doing this random task over and over and over again, but you just kind of feel like you're just running in place, right? So like giving people purpose, right? Giving people um, the feeling that they are in fact progressing, that there is like this next level uh, that they can potentially achieve. Like, yeah, you're right. Like that's the kind of thing that emotionally and mentally will provide the buy-in because again, it's not always about money, but it is about money, right? Because as much as people say, oh, we love restoration and we love helping people, you take the money tomorrow, nobody's putting down any fans. Like it's just not going to happen, there. right? So it is about the money, but then also having that mental and emotional buy-in uh, from the team members, because again, that's the core of the company. Like that's, that's who's out yeah. there. That's who's representing whatever your company mission is. So let me ask you this, where, if our listeners and uh, people that are viewing the podcast, if they want to go ahead and get in contact with you, they want some more information about your company, about how you can potentially help them get from, you know, where they are right now to the next level, what's typically the best channel for them to contact you? At? So, so the, the first thing is my, my email, philip 2 ls P-H-I-L-L-I-P at businessmentors.net. That's the URL as well businessmentors.net. Um, when you go on our website, by the way, there's a really good tool there. Um, go ahead and download that. You have to give me your email address. Uh, it's a, I won't spam you. It'll be permission marketing, but basically a checklist that you can look at and you can grade your own company and you can define where your priorities ought to be 
based on how you grade your own company. So I won't know anything about um, what's going on in your business, but if you wanted to just uh, have a tool that will help you improve your business, there's a great one for you, no charge. Um, you'll find that on the homepage on our website. Um, you can awesome. find me. And for everybody that's listening, I'll go ahead and I'll leave the video description in the video description as well as in the show notes. I'll go ahead and I'll leave a link directly to that so that way you can go ahead and check it out, print out the checklist and kind of audit your company and then see where it takes you from there. Yeah, you'll be able to find me. Um, I, I spend very little time on Facebook. I think Facebook is a, a kind of a, I, I have a tough time figuring out where that fits in the business world, but I'm very active on LinkedIn. Go find me on LinkedIn. Um, Restoration Business Owners and Managers. I've got about 10,000 people in that group and we talk about, you know, I try to bring relevant articles that help people improve their business. So go take a look at you. Find me on LinkedIn. And um, I, I believe I just signed up for a Gitter account the other day. I'm not quite sure how to use that, but it's brand new. And so you'll be able to find me at Business awesome. Ventures on that one as well at some point. Awesome, Phil. Well, thank you so much, man. We appreciate you taking the time today to, you know, share everything that you know about the business and, uh, you know, all of your insights. And again, Restoration Nation, make sure that you check out Phil. I'll leave descriptions in the video description below. I'll leave links to all the social media channels and all that stuff. If you feel that he's a good fit and that he can help you get to the next level, make sure that you check him out. You've been listening to Restoration Domination, interviewing the restoration business's top industry insiders, the movers and shakers, the hustlers and hackers. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. Hook up with us on Instagram and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Restoration Domination to catch video interviews, highlights, and behind-the-scenes content. And follow your host at Rico Garcia Jr. Till next time, this is Restoration Domination. Hustle. Hack. Dominate.